I think it's important to continue learning to grow as a professional. Skillshare makes that happen. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. I was on the website recently looking for course options. There's a great class, Productivity for Creatives. Build a system that brings out your best. And this is taught by Thomas Frank. This is a great class for people like me who have a lot going on, but love to procrastinate. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Ratchet and get a free trial of premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash Ratchet. Thank you, Skillshare, for sponsoring this episode. Feeling your best starts with what you eat. Sakara gives you the ability to not just eat healthy, but truly enjoy it with chef-crafted plant-rich meals that build a foundation for radiant health. Sakara is a nutrition company that focuses on overall wellness, starting with what you eat. Their organic, ready-to-eat meals are made with powerful plant-based ingredients and are designed to boost your energy, improve your digestion, and get your skin glowing. I just put in my Sakara order for the upcoming week. I got this amazing sweet potato-based Thai burger, the Szechuan noodles with roasted carrots, and also the Saqqara burrito bowl. I cannot wait for my next order to arrive. And right now, Saqqara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to saqqara.com slash ratchet or enter code ratchet at checkout. That's Saqqara. S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash ratchet to get 20% off your first order. Sakara dot com slash ratchet. I recently found a new bra that I don't want to snatch off as soon as I come in the house. And I figured out why. Third Love is designed to be a perfect fit. They use the measurements of millions of women to design bras with all-day comfort and support. To make sure that you get the perfect fit, they have the fitting room quiz. It's like a personal shopper for your boobs. The fitting room quiz focuses on size, breast shape, current fit issues, and your personal style to deliver bras and underwear that are perfect for you. It's time to break up with your bad bra and fall in love with better bras and underwear. Your boobs deserve it. Third Love knows your one true fit is out there. So right now they are offering my listeners 20% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash ratchet now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash ratchet for 20% off today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you are listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. I celebrated my second LA-versary this week, and I didn't even realize it. It was on, on April 3rd. It was my second year living in LA, and the day came and went, and I didn't even notice. I got this alert on my phone. It was the day all my stuff was delivered, that my boxes came from the East Coast. The first, I guess, three or four days, I was sleeping on an air mattress and living out of my suitcases. I didn't have any of my stuff. So I got the alert, and I was like, oh, my God. I didn't realize it had been two years. It's passed so fast. And then a lot of it, I wasn't here. Like I spent a significant amount of time in 2020, at least a good four months of it, on the East Coast again because of COVID. Just more space at my parents' house, so I was there. But I've been back in LA with no break since November. I haven't been out of the state since early November. I went to Atlanta for my Pantene photo shoot, but since then, I've been stationary. But I didn't even know it was my LAversary, so I didn't do anything to celebrate. And then when I finally realized it, I still didn't make any plans. I'm in the middle of a move. I think I told you all that already. I, um, I'm moving for like the third time in two years, but I need the space. So I, I don't feel guilty about it. And what little guilt I had, I just did away with. One of my, um, my good friends, 
and you may have seen this because she was very well known and very well loved, Bidwin Charles. Many people knew her as a legal commentator on MSNBC, but I knew her as as my friend, as just Midwin. I I can't talk about it yet. She was, uh, I'm still in that phase where every time I think about it, I'm just like, I can't believe she's gone. It, it keeps hitting me in waves. Yeah, let's let's move on to another topic. Not for lack of respect, but just uh, it'll derail me. And this podcast will just be me crying and lamenting. Midwin passed. And then um, another good friend, Henry Stewart in D.C., another person who everyone knew and everyone loved. Just a really good dude. He is, was, God. He's just one of those people that, like, you see every single time you leave the house. And so once he realized that I was um, besties for like, I don't know, 30 years with his, um, to him, his little cousin, he just became like super protective of me. And <laughs> I remember after I moved back to D.C., I was at some party for CBC and I was talking to some dude. He was fine. And Henry came up afterward and he was like, that ain't it. And I was like, no, it was just, you know, we were just talking and, you know, we exchanged conversations. And he was like, he got a whole wife and three kids. I was like, oh, that ain't it. (laughs) That ain't it. He was a really great guy as well. And he died. He died. I think about him every so often. I've gotten past the, I can't believe Henry's dead phase, but... His best friend in D.C. just posted a picture of him earlier today, and it's a it's a scholarship fund in his memory. He was a Morehouse man, and it just it hit me all over again. And I was just like, I thought I had moved on from the I can't believe he's gone, and I'm back on the same loop. I'm like, I can't believe Henry's dead. I just I can't believe he's gone. It's been a hard, I say month. I just I just know a lot of people who passed away, and like so young. I remember being like 23, 24, and I was dating this really amazing dude. And I broke up with him because he was old. (laughs) He was nine years older than me. So maybe he was 34. And we were just in different places in, in our lives. Like literally at the time, like I wanted to go to Miami and dance on tables. And he was talking about getting married. And I was like, I don't need. Um, so I broke up with him. Because he was old. And now, you know, people are passing away at 46, 47, 48. And I'm like, oh, my God, they're so young. So much life. So much life to be lived. And you're like, you know, you mourn people. And then you think, like, of how all the tomorrows that they thought were promised. Like, when I, you know, when I get X, I'll do Y. Places they plan to go, the things they plan to do, the things they plan to buy, the experiences they plan to have. And they were gone before they had an opportunity to. And as much trepidation as I had about moving into this new place, like I really had to talk myself into it. I was like, I can afford it, but why do I feel like I don't deserve it? It's a big ass loft. And I'm just like, but it's just me. Do I need all this space? It has two bathrooms. I'm like, it's just me. I can only pee in one toilet at a time. It's this big ass, it's this big ass kitchen. And I'm like, I barely even cook. Like I make the basics to feed myself, but it's not like I'm throwing down. It doesn't matter. I want it and I can have it. And I'm glad that I made the choice to get it. If I was still hemming and hawing after like the death of of two of my friends in their forties, I definitely would have gone ahead and get it. So I'm moving next Friday. Ask me what I packed. Ask me if one box has been packed. Actually, yes, I did pack one box. I took the books on the bookshelf off the shelf and put them in boxes. That's, that's it. I haven't, I haven't packed anything in, anything else. I'm moving in less than a week. It'll get done. I don't know how, but it'll get done. Speaking of boxes, I have boxes of merchandise in my apartment. I put most of my site on sale. If you have not purchased your Don't Waste Your Pretty merchandise, it is on sale. It is 20% off on my site. There's no code. Just go to the site and and get what you want to get. It's an end of season sale, but it's also, let's clear out this merchandise so we can get on to, y'all been hitting me up. Like, where's our Ratchet and Respectable merch? It's been like four months. We want merch. We want colors. We want Vs because we want to show our titties. 
And I was like, oh, okay, all right. So we're working on that. Just to be transparent, because we've talked about this a couple times. I want the logo of the podcast on a shirt. Like the little cartoon of like me and my Afro drinking coffee. I want that on a shirt. So we're trying to figure out like how to get it right. I ain't going to sell you no ish that I wouldn't wear. So when I get it right, we'll get it on the site. But in the meantime, there is Don't Waste Your Pretty merch on the site and it is 20% off. And also for the many of you that have asked about Don't Waste Your Pretty V's, they're coming. They might be in house by the time you hear this. So we're working on getting those white gold V's to you. What else is going on? Oh, St. Louis. St. Louis has its first... Black mayor, first black female mayor, let me be correct. Her name is Tashara, Tashara Jones. She's elected on Tuesday, and later this month she will begin leading. I'm like, that's quick. She was formerly the city's treasurer. Let's talk about what she said about her victory. When they asked her about being the first black woman elected mayor, she said, quote, making history as the first black woman mayor is not lost on me is not lost on me at this moment. I'm also looking at how little girls will look at this moment going forward and will see that they can be anything and that they have a mayor that looks like them. She said one of the reasons that she decided to run for mayor was because of her experience of raising a 13-year-old son in North St. Louis. She said that like many black parents, she has had the talk. We know what the talk is. But she's had that with her son. She said, quote, I lead with the lens of raising a black child in this city. I want children to feel safe. She went on to say that she would not hesitate to confront racism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, or religious intolerance. She said, quote, I will not stay silent when I spot any injustice. She recognizes that among her biggest challenges... She will be having tough conversations with progressive white residents about what it means to be an ally for black people. I think it's important to add that LaShondra, she is a graduate of Hampton University and also Harvard University School of Government. Very happy for her. Much congratulations to Miss Jones. Now, I read her statement about how proud she is to be the first black woman as mayor. Now, one... It was a good statement. I felt proud as a black woman to know she was elected. And I felt prouder reading her statement in which she proudly acknowledged her blackness. I'll tell you about somebody else who's a first black. And I was proud that he was appointed, but I was not proud of his statements in his very first press conference. The University of North Carolina, UNC, has its first black head coach for men's basketball. He is a man by the name of Hubert. Let's look him up. Let's let's look him up. I want to make sure I get the details right on this. His name is Hubert Davis. And if nigga what was a person, it would be him. It would be him. I was not familiar with Hubert Davis. I know that he played college basketball. I know that he played professional ball. And one of the reasons that I even paid attention to him being appointed as the first black head coach is because I got a black daddy. I got a black daddy who loves a black coach. We root for the black coach. It's just, it's what we do. Now, growing up, my dad always had season tickets to Georgetown as long as I can remember. Good seats too. When I got old enough to date, when I was in high school, I had the same boyfriend through most of high school, but we would go to the Georgetown games to watch Allen Iverson play. That's what we were there for. But my dad had the season tickets because you got to support the black coach. John Thompson was the black coach at Georgetown. My daddy didn't go to Georgetown. Some of his friends went to Georgetown, but they ain't got nothing to do with why he had season tickets. And Georgetown was his favorite college basketball team for no other reason than John Thompson was black and was the head coach. That's it. So I saw that Hubert Davis had been appointed as the first black coach to North Carolina. Again, I don't follow sports, but I root for everybody black. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess I got to pay attention to UNC now because they got a black coach. I was all in just based on the blackness. Your boy Hubert, he did a press conference. And at said press conference, he got a softball question that everyone had to see coming. Everybody with some sense. 
a reporter asked Hubert, it was, a, it was so easy. He said, could you expound on what it means to you to be the first black coach at UNC? And Hubert looked frustrated. Like he had no clue that this question was coming. Like he, he had to, he, he got real silent and he was, you know, moving his mouth, but nothing was coming out. Like this was like, this was a question out of the blue. I could tell you what Hubert said. You're not going to believe me though. I'm going to play the clip for you. I'm going to play the question too. Cause I don't want you to think I'm on some like, Oh, gotcha shit. No, no, no. Your boy, your boy, Hubert jumped all the way the fuck out there. Let me, let me play it for you real quick. Coach Davis, if you would speak to um, your feelings of being the first black head coach at UNC men's basketball. I know that in terms of Division I head coaches all around the country, only 26% of the head coaches for Division I men's basketball are compromised by minorities, specifically African Americans. I know that it is significant that I'm the fourth african-american head coach in any sport in the history of the university of north carolina i'm very proud to be african-american but i'm also very proud that my wife is white and i'm very proud that my three beautiful unbelievable kids are a combination of both of us i want y'all to know that there was no edits there there was no edits there in hubert's response there, there were no i didn't make any edits they asked the man the significance to him of being the first black head coach. He's like, it's a big deal. I'm proud to do it. And I'm also proud of my white wife. What the fuck your white wife got to do with anything, sir? Now look, look, look. I understand. I understand people get nervous at press conferences. He's done a million press conferences in his career. He's a college athlete. He's a professional athlete. This is not his first time at the rodeo. I get it. I still get nervous. I get it. He had some talking points, clearly. These are th- there are things that he wanted to say. I get it. It's coming to the end of the press conference when this question comes up. He might have been thinking like, you know what? Shit, I didn't thank my wife. I didn't thank my kids. I'm going to be in trouble if I don't thank these people. I don't want that smoke in my house. I want a happy life with a happy wife. I get it. I get it. And if sir had thrown in like, you know, I'm proud to do this. And, he, and by the way, I want to thank my wife and children. For supporting me. Without them, I would not be the person I am. I would not be the man that I am. Everyone would have said, you know, we didn't really ask about the wife or the kids, but everybody understands a married man, a father, he needs to do that. He needs to acknowledge his wife and children. He needs to say thank you. That's that's good. That's good and the right thing to do. Nobody would have said a word. I'm proud of my white wife. Nigga, what? What? I heard about this story because Damon Young from over at Very Smart Brothers, he wrote about it. And he was like, it was almost non-eventful until the very end. And so Damon was describing what happened. And I was like, you know what, Damon? I know you to be a truthful man. I've known you for like 15 years. I don't know this to be you. And yet here you are lying and making things up because this would never happen. And then Damon was like, exhibit A, please view the clip. What the fuck? I don't care if black men don't want to date black women. I don't care if you have a white wife, an Asian wife, a Latino wife, a royal blue wife. I really honestly don't care. As long as you're not dragging black women to justify your choice of not marrying a black woman or being with a black woman, I don't give a shit. If you don't say anything dragging black women, I'm just going to assume that you met this woman who you thought was hot and y'all clicked and that's who you just decided to be with because that was the person that worked for you. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt for that shit. But when you talk about the things that you're proud of and then you mention like your wife's whiteness as one of those things, that's just fucking weird. I'm like, you really out here pandering to these white people. And he started off really well. Here are the percentages. Here are the odds that are against me. And here I am. I'm very proud. He said something about the number of black people that compromise something. I was like, sir, you mean comprise. But again, people misspeak. I do it all the time on this podcast. I can't pronounce people's names for shit. I'm terrible at it. I'm aware. That said, there was a plethora of answers that you could have given 
about blackness, black pride, personal pride, personal accomplishments, black first. And he was on his way there. He was on his way there just fine. I'm also proud of my white wife. Is marrying a white woman an accomplishment? I don't think marriage is an accomplishment in general. I mean, staying married, yes. Marriage is not for the faint, not for the faint. I say that to say that. I posted the video on Facebook. 50,000 people watched the clip on Facebook and like a thousand of them were like, what the fuck? They had the exact same reaction that I did. Sir, there was one person in the comments and was like, I feel like as black people, we're being too sensitive. Like, so what if he mentioned his white wife? And they were like, if a, if a white man, a man of European descent, if he was at a press conference and he said, and I'm proud of my black wife, would y'all have such a problem? And I really had to think about it. And I was like, actually, I would. And I came up with this scenario in my head and I was like, say a white man was appointed to the head basketball position at an HBCU. And I'm just making a wild assumption because I don't, again, pay attention to sports like that. I'm, I'm guessing that most of the head coaches for men's basketball at HBCUs are black. I could be entirely wrong about that. In this scenario, I'm imagining a white man is appointed and at this press conference, someone asked him, how does it feel to be the first white man who is going to be head coach at a historically black college and university? And there's a whole different context because obviously like white people don't have the long history of discrimination de facto and de jure that black people have in the United States, right? But just on its surface, if the white man has said, I'm really proud to be the first white person, 99.9% of coaches at HBCUs are black. I'm the first white person, but I'm also proud that my wife is black. I'd be like, nigga, you pandering. You sound like Hillary Clinton talking about I got hot sauce in my bag swag. You're pandering. That's it. And I was like, that's exactly what Hubert Davis was doing. You're trying to let them know that like, yeah, I'm this black dude and I got this prestigious job, but I'm like married to a white chick. So I'm not like, you know, I don't know, like a thug black dude or like a Black Lives Matter black dude. I'm like an all lives matter black dude. And that's not to say that every black man married to a white woman is, is all lives matter. That is to say that if you are a black man who runs around telling people how proud you are to have a white wife, you want some all lives matter shit. It's okay to have pride in your blackness. It's, it's, it's okay. Because I guarantee you, he said that shit to make himself like more amenable to like the white audience. They still going to call you a nigga, nigga. Now you don't even have black people who will ride for you. You'd be like, oh, you wanted to be, you know, special black, fancy black with your white wife that you're so proud of, your biracial children that you felt an odd need to mention at the most random of times. When you, when white people come for you, when you have your nigga wake up call, because it happens to every black person that thinks that they're, you know, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Okay. It always happens. When it does, go talk to them white people you was pandering to. Don't come talk to black people everybody's black daddy and let me not be like what's the word sexist and pretend like women don't watch basketball many do many love it many play it i'm just not one of them i did play in high school though i was a guard i was fucking terrible that's not the point the point is what is the point oh people were really excited about you being a black first at a d1 school like unc black folks we was rooting for you we were all rooting for you. You just fucked it up. What was the reason? What was the reason? I don't care if other people can see my search history, but there are some things that need to be private. I know most of you are probably thinking, why don't you just use incognito mode? Let me tell you something. Incognito mode does not hide your activity. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history your internet service provider can still see every single website you've ever visited. That's why even when I'm at home, I never go online without ExpressVPN. It doesn't matter if you get your internet from Verizon or Comcast or AT&T. ISPs in the U.S. can legally sell your information to ad companies. 
ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites you visit. I use ExpressVPN so that I can watch TV and films with the East Coast so I can actually go on the internet at any time and not see spoilers for all my favorite shows. Most of the time, I don't even realize I have ExpressVPN on. It runs seamlessly in the background and it's so easy to use. All I have to do is click one button and I'm protected. Protect your online activity today with the VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired. Visit my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash ratchet, and you can get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash ratchet expressvpn.com slash ratchet to learn more. Jeannie Kane is one of my most trusted sources for everyday elevated essentials, pieces that will keep me looking and feeling my best for years to come. I'm slightly obsessed right now with their James dress. It's this white cotton linen, long sleeve, floor length dress. It's very simple, but also decadent. It's one of the favorite pieces in my wardrobe. Jeannie Kane believes that getting dressed should be the easiest part of your routine. With polished basics that will never go out of style, they make everyday moments a breeze. Now, you might already have a favorite dress or a well-worn pair of sandals, but if it doesn't make you say, I'll never take this off, then it isn't Jeannie Kane. Find your forever pieces at GeniKane.com and get 15% off your first order when you use code RATCHET at checkout. That's J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E.com. Promo code RATCHET. In news of other lost black men, Kanye West, he has a new documentary series coming to Netflix, according to Billboard. The documentary series will span over two decades of footage and home videos of Kanye West's life. Allegedly, Netflix paid $30 million for this documentary. Though, a person familiar with the matter, a source, according to Variety, says that that number is not accurate. Yeah. I hope it's close. I like to see black people get paid. The series is said to include never seen before footage of Kanye West, according to Variety. Just like to make sure I'm citing my sources and will cover his career in music and fashion, his failed 2020 presidential bid and the death of his mother, Donda West. The series does not yet have a title or a release date. Where do we stand on Kanye right now? Like, is he back in... Black people's good graces after the gospel album, which I did not love when I first heard it. Most of it, I was like, "Mm -mm, mm -mm." I feel like this is a gimmick. There's two songs on there that I really like. And one is a sample of God is. And even with the auto tune, it's amazing. And it led me down the rabbit hole to find the original which was by James Cleveland, who somehow I was not familiar with until Kanye's album came out, which I feel like very disgraced by. I went to church like almost every Sunday for most of my formative years, like my mother believed in church. And every Sunday on the way to church or the rare, sun- or the rare Sunday we didn't attend church, we listened to WHUR 96.3 in D.C. with Jackie Gales Webb, and she played all the gospel music, old and new. And somehow, I just never got an introduction to James Cleveland. It didn't really come until I listened to this Kanye album and was like, I know the original to this sample is fire. And I went down the rabbit hole, and then like I found all things James Cleveland, and I am like obsessed. You know, I always talk about the Aretha documentary that I watch every morning. James Cleveland is, I don't know what his official title is for that. Like, there's a choir director. Maybe he's a musical director. Maybe he's a producer. But he is front and center at that documentary and the album that was made in conjunction with said documentary. But it's still, to this day, the best-selling gospel album of all time. I say all that to say I'm embarrassed that I didn't know who James Cleveland was 
until Kanye West. So, if Jesus is king, gimmick or not, did nothing else, it brought me to James Cleveland. And through James Cleveland's music, I became closer to God. I backed off Kanye after that. I can be very critical of Kanye. One, because... At one point, I was one of his biggest fans, and I'm just sort of disappointed in some of the choices that he's made over the years. I respect that it's his life to live as he sees fit. But again, I'm not sure how we all feel about Kanye West. I've been listening to the Graduation album and 808 and Heartbreaks a lot for like the last month or so. Like sometimes I just have these Kanye phases. But I love that dude right now. I love his music. I I miss the old Kanye. I tell you that much. I could easily drag Kanye for a million things, but I know when that Netflix, but I know when that Netflix doc drops, I'll be waiting up for it and watching it immediately excited because I know it's going to be interesting. It might be crazy, but it's going to be interesting. It's Kanye. Who else is having a good week? Little Nas X. He is having an amazing week. Almost. He had those Satan shoes, which a lot of people are really up in arms about. Nike filed a lawsuit and a federal judge sided with Nike and stopped the sale of the Satan shoes, which were refurbished Nikes, essentially. So that was not good for little Nas X. But I honestly think that was just marketing and publicity anyway. They were only selling like 666, the satanic number, 666 pairs of shoes. Yeah. But in better news for little Nas X... His latest song, so much controversy. His latest song, Montero, Call Me By Your Name. It debuted at number one on Billboard. This is Lil Nas X's second number one single, the first being the obvious Old Town Road. Montero is also Lil Nas X's first song to reach number one on the global Spotify charts. He has 7.79 million streams per day. He's also topped more than 100 million views of the Montero video. I like little Nas X. I know that some of my listeners and, and readers, when I, when I write about him, feel very strongly about his video. They don't like um, the depictions of the devil or hell or what appears to be embracing satanic imagery. I addressed this on a previous podcast. That's not the point of the video. Like, stop telling gay people that they go into hell. That's the point. And it'll be really, really helpful to talk about the actual point. That whole, oh my God, the children, the children. Yes, the gay children that y'all keep talking about going to hell. That situation needs to be addressed. He said that he would be celebrating his achievements this week, that number one on Billboard especially. He said, I'm going to go do so much sex tonight. (laughs) Oh, ratchet and respectable ass. Good for him. He also added, I hope my haters are sad. I hope they are crying. I want your tears to fill my Grammy cup. (laughs) I love this kid. I love him. Lots more good news this week. Amanda Gorman, our our youth poet laureate. You remember Amanda. She spoke at, at inauguration and then she spoke at the Super Bowl. And she's been seemingly everywhere since then. And now the cover of Vogue. I've seen two different covers. I don't know which one is digital and which one is print. I'll buy either one. They're both gorgeous. But the one that's most heavily circulating is Amanda with her braids. And she's wearing kente cloth. Virgil Ogbo, who's the head designer at Louis Vuitton. I know him from Off-White because I want them damn Off-White Jordans. When I was broke, I wanted them shoes so bad and was scheming a way to get them. And now that I'm not broke no more, I'm like, oh, God, $700 for a shoe. That's crazy. Is anybody else like that? When you got coin, you be cheap as shit. (laughs) When I'm broke, I want to ball out. When I got a little coin, I'm just like, oh, no, that's high. That's high. I got food at home. (laughs) That's not the point. The point is Virgil designed an exclusive kente cloth print that is now part of the Louis Vuitton collection. And that print is featured in the dress that Amanda Gorman is wearing on the cover of Vogue. And I was like, Brother Virgil, keep it to Virgils. (laughs) If I know black people like I know black people, you need to go ahead and make everything that Louis Vuitton makes out of that kente cloth design. 
there are few things that black people love more than blackness and luxury shit. Make a purse, make a bag, make some sweatpants, make a hat, make a everything. Put it on some shoes. Black people going to buy that shit up left and right. Go on and make your money. I stopped being cheap for that. A Kente cloth Louis Vuitton bag? You know I like my Louis Vuitton. Now I was on TV. Folks used to drag the fuck out of me. I'm like, why is she wearing Louis Vuitton? And I was like, I'm from D.C. This is normal. Which I wear coach bags. And ain't nothing wrong with coach. I like coach. Coach and that Basquiat collaboration, very cute. Very cute. The people were like, oh, she's so bougie. I'm from PG County. The fuck you think I'm supposed to be? Shit. That's not the point. The point is, Amanda Grebman is on the cover of Vogue, looking beautiful and model-esque and perfect and wonderful. I love her to like absolute pieces. But do not get just caught up in the pictures, the images that are floating all over the internet. I read the article. She's just a delight. Like she's just wonderful and fascinating and just smart and and just all goodness. She's all of what, 22, 23? Actually, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the picture now. Those are Senegalese twists. They're not braids. It's It's a worthy distinction. It's two different things. But ma'am is just, she's beautiful and she's gracious and she's wonderful. And she's very 23, but also like very 65 at the same time. As I was reading, like I, and I scribbled down quotes. I have a notebook that I keep of just quotes. I had to go get my notebook and was like, let me write this down. Let me see if I can find a quote for you. Here we go. The writer is asking her about inauguration and what she was inspired to write after appearing at inauguration, her feelings and thoughts, etc. And Gorman shares, quote, I've learned that it's okay to be afraid. And what's more, it's okay to seek greatness. That does not make me a black hole seeking attention. It makes me a supernova. Yeah, I love her. But read the article. There's like tons of gems. Amanda just sounds like the most amazing little sis ever in life. I was like, oh no, I want a little sister or... I think I want a niece. I want a niece. Can someone like make me a niece? I need an LA niece. Like my favorite babies are on the East Coast. Like I need, I need some babies. Not of like my own, Jesus. But like somebody's babies that I can like, you know, play with for a few hours and then, you know, give them back and go back to like my irresponsible life. Like it's the best of both worlds. What else is happening? What else is happening? I have a little list. Oh, Tiffany Aliche. She came by Ratchet and Respectable to chat with us about her new book, Getting Good. No, is it Get Good with Money? Getting Good with Money. Hold on. I'll make sure I get it right. The Budgetista. Get Good with Money debuted on two New York Times bestsellers list. She is number four on the advice list and number 10 on the business list. You better get it, Tiff. You better get it. She posted that she landed on the New York Times bestsellers list. And I saw it. I gasped, first of all, because I was so happy for her. And then I cried. (laughs) Like, I wrote the damn book. I was like, oh, my God. I'm so happy for her. I know this was a dream of hers. And I'm very happy that she reached it. It's also a dream of mine. But I ain't been on the New York Times bestsellers list, y'all. So when someone in my sister circle gets to live the dream, I'm like Taraji P. Henson screaming over Viola. I'm happy. Somebody got to live this goddamn dream. If it ain't me yet, then it might as well be you now. So congratulations to the budget Nista. If you did not have a chance to listen to my interview with her, she was great. Like people were tweeting me. Like I paused the podcast in the middle of the interview and went and bought her book, (laughs) which I was like, yeah, I totally get it. (laughs) Cause it was a great freaking interview. She's amazing. I'm so, 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 so happy for her. I have this note here. I can't even read what I wrote. Exterminate Butler? Oh! Oh, it's an HBO documentary. I started watching it and I was really, really tired. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning and I couldn't go to sleep. And then like I put it on and I went to sleep. But that's no reflection of the actual film. It's a new, uh, it's a new project from Raul Peck. He is the Oscar-nominated filmmaker behind I Am Not Your Negro. Do you remember that? It came out maybe four years ago. It was a documentary about racism uh, focused on James Baldwin. It was freaking amazing if you haven't seen it. I, I saw it in theaters, and I remember pulling out my notebook in the theater to like start scribbling down thoughts. Like it was, it was really, really, really good. But he's back with a new documentary called Exterminate All the Brutes. 
Peck did that documentary and he said he was confounded and disappointed to realize that some audiences, particularly in Europe, weren't fully comprehending the analysis of what racism is. And they believed racism to primarily be an American concern. And so Peck says, quote, I wanted to prove them wrong, that in fact they are the origin story of racism and that United States racism is just the continuation of a long history of Eurocentric domination. So I didn't get all the way into the film. What I recall before I went to sleep was seeing a Native American woman being scalped like literally cutting off like the top of her head. And I was like, oh, hell no. I can't watch this and go to sleep. My dream's gonna be all fucked up. So I didn't turn it off. I just rolled over in the other direction. But according to The Guardian, Exterminate All the Brutes is a sweeping journey through some of the most horrific moments in civilization over the past half millennium to trace the roots of humanity's worst impulses. Genocide, slavery, fascism, white supremacy, and colonialism. It's a four-hour series that examines Europe's genocidal colonization of Africa. It tackles an indigenous people's history of the United States. Uh, It's a tragedy. And then there's an analysis of power and silence focusing on Haitian history. Oh, that ought to be good. So Peck spent three years assembling a battery of imagery, including archival footage, film clips, infographics, historical documents, photographs, artwork, scripted interludes, and animated scenes. I do remember something. There was a white woman in like a beautiful green dress, like from golden age Hollywood and some sailors. Please, Lord, do not let this be something I pictured in my dream. Please let this be actually something on the screen because people are going to be like, this is the shit you dream about, D? No, there was a white woman dancing and she and the sailors were making fun of what, for lack of a better description, would be dusky natives. Like the kind of people of color that are found when white people go and invade places they ain't got no business being and find people who were minding their business with their own way of life that white people don't understand and be like, oh, the ignorant dusky natives, like, no, they, they not ignorant. They just, they don't speak English because it ain't their language. Like, you're centering yourself. Like, okay, whatever. But I remember something about, like, white people singing about and making fun of dusky natives. That's before I rolled over, too. But, yeah, so um, when I have some downtime, maybe when I'm packing, I'll get a chance to watch this documentary. I'm really excited about it. I pretty much love everything that comes on HBO. Mm, Claudia Jordan. Claudia Jordan is on my list. And just to be clear, I don't have anything against her. But she did some dumb shit this week. She did. On Tuesday night, Jordan tweeted, Rest in Paradise DMX. Alongside a broken heart, a crown, and praying hands emojis. Um, As of Thursday afternoon... On the West Coast, it's 1.38 as I'm recording this. Um, DMX is still alive. He might not be alive and thriving, but he is alive. He may be alive and in a vegetative state, but he is alive. So people were like, why the fuck would Claudia Jordan tweet that? I, I have no idea. To my knowledge, no major news site has, has reported accurately or inaccurately even that DMX has died. Probably because he's not dead. No family member has has publicly said that, that DMX is, has gone on to see the king. Probably because he's not dead. There's a tendency for people to want to be first with information. And first with information about death. Like, people get really weird about that. Like, they want to be first to tell somebody that somebody has died. I'm going I'm to I'm just do a quick PSA. If you are not an immediate member of the family, or you have not been appointed as a spokesperson by the family, like you're the family lawyer, you're the family doctor, you're the publicist for the deceased, the publicist for the family, something of that nature. It is not your goddamn place and not your goddamn job to announce anyone's death. 
If your mama passed, your immediate family. Say what you feel like saying. If somebody else mama passed, it's your auntie. No, no. She got kids? It's their job. It's not your job. A celebrity, you, you a celebrity, and there's another celebrity, and you not married to that celebrity? You not the daughter of that celebrity? You not the mama of that celebrity? No, no. Not your job, not your place. Immediate family makes that announcement. Just, just to be clear. Just to be clear. My friend Midwin, who I talked about at the beginning of the podcast, Midwin passed on Tuesday morning on the East Coast. On Tuesday afternoon, I got a text from a friend who was very, very close to her and knew that I was friends with her. And she wanted me to know that Midwin passed so that I wouldn't see it scrolling on social media and flip out. I appreciated that very much. That was around, at the latest, 12.30 p.m. I got calls from various people who were in grief, in shock, in mourning. We talked on the phone. We shared text messages. I called various people and was like, oh, my God. And we kind of sat on the phone, sometimes not even saying anything, just, just sitting there, not alone, that someone else was there in our grief, because sometimes that's all you got. Midwin was loved, loved, and I hope she knew it when she was here. Like, ah, hundreds of people knew, people with platforms far bigger than mine, who could have easily posted a picture, made an announcement, a rest in peace, Midwin Charles. No one, no one did that, and no one had to be told to do that because every single one of us knew and no one said a word online until after Midwin's family made a post on her page announcing her passing. Did people want to say something? Surely. Did people want to mourn and grieve? Did people want to share what their friend meant to them? Absolutely. But out of respect for her and her family, no one said anything until after the family did. The family put up an announcement, and then after that, you got a flood of pictures of Midwin, remembering her, honoring her, sharing stories about her, what an amazing woman she was. Ugh, such a tragedy that she's gone. I'm, I am heartbroken. I scrolled through our text messages. I, I got text back to 2014, even though I, I've known her longer than that. I think I met her when Ween was being launched. I think that's how we met. Is she's one of them people that's been around so long? It's like you part of the furniture of my life. Like we didn't talk every day, but you know, when something crazy happened, like you know, pop culture, politics, whatever, mutual friends, because you know, people make bad decisions. Like she's one of those people that I would fire off a text to. But when I was scrolling through our text messages, I found a, a text exchange about us mourning. Another mutual friend, Mike Freeney, I think he passed in, in 2017. One of the dopest people I have ever met. Like when I was a kid, I remember doing something stupid and my dad saying something like, you know, well, so-and-so jumped off a ledge. Would you jump too? The obvious answer so the punishment can end is no, of course not. But as an adult, be like, yeah, it depends. If Mike Freeney was like, yo, we going over this ledge, fuck it. We're going over the ledge. It's just, it is what it is. It, whatever happens, happens. But Midwin and I were in deep, deep mourning over Mike Freeney passing. Because like Midwin, he was just one of those amazing people that like everyone loved. And then <sighs> fast forward four years, I'm saying the same thing about Midwin that I wrote to Midwin. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm not losing it. I'm not losing it. I can't. I can't. Because All American comes back on the CW on Monday. And we have an interview with the showrunner in K.J. Okaro Carroll. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. And she does not deserve to come after the host having a fucking meltdown about her friend passing. I, um, I got into All American late, like a lot of people. It's on the CW, but I wasn't paying attention. And then during quarantine, I think I'd watched everything else on Netflix. And I was like, well, what is All American? 
and there was a picture of this black kid and Tay Diggs as background to the words all American. And I was like, well, let me see what these black people are doing is so all American. And I just got hooked on the show. I think I watched like the first two seasons, three days, maybe four. I was completely hooked. I'm really happy to have NKJ on Ratchet and Respectable. She's a writer. She is a producer. She's a showrunner. She's living my dream. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome NKJ Okaro Carroll to Ratchet and Respectable. And Keiichi, I am so happy to have you on Ratchet and Respectable. I am a huge, huge fan. I am so excited to be on this podcast. You don't even understand. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I also want you to know, like, as much as, like, I love you, I be cursing you out once a week over these kids. I know. A lot of people curse me out over these kids. Please, I be yelling at the kids, forgetting I wrote it. Before I completely fan out on you, can you talk to me about... All American and your mission for this show as the showrunner? Because I think it's a really clear mission. Um, but what I think it is might not be what you think it is. And I'm assuming you have a mission here. Absolutely. I mean, I, listen, I grew up watching, I love YA stuff. And I grew up, you know, on the original Beverly Hills 90210. This is me aging myself. But I grew up on the original Beverly Hills 90210. I loved Dawson's Creek. That was a, a huge part of sort of why I became a writer. Um, and um, One Tree Hill and all these shows like that. But the one thing that was consistent sort of across the board is I was assimilating into their world. These weren't kids that looked like me and my friends. And so with All American, it was sort of the opportun- opportunity to finally tell the story from, you know, the Black youth perspective in America. And, you know, especially as a mom of two boys, I wanted them to see that their lives were worthy of being the A story. Right. Like their lives, their interactions with their friends, their love triangles, their struggle. My son is a a student athlete. His struggle on the basketball court or the baseball field was worthy of being an A story. And his life was worthy of people tuning in every week and yelling at their TV screens and throwing their shoes the way I did growing up. And so that's what I wanted with All American. I wanted a chance for the world to see our youth. Um, for who they are in all their diversity. And I don't mean diversity as in Black, I just mean diversity as in the spectrum of Black, right? And that, you know, we're not all just athletes or we're not all just rappers. And yes, that's part of Spencer's story and that's part of Coop's story, but there's also, you know, Olivia and her finding her voice and expanding her bubble beyond Beverly Hills. There's Layla, who's building up this sort of badass... Um, career as a female producer, you know, there's um, Kia, who is determined that she is going to leave this world a better place than how she found it if she has to march through the streets to do it. I just wanted to represent us in all of our glory. And in all honesty, if seeing Spencer James on the screen changes even one person's perspective in the real world, that's one more person that helps my sons get home safely at night. Because when they see them, they think of a Spencer James as opposed to whatever ridiculousness has been put out there that has the world fear in our Black youth and our Black men the way they do. So, you know, I wanted to do all of that while, you know, entertaining y'all and and creating these crazy love triangles and having these kids act dumb and all of that stuff. I mean, we are entertained. I, I, I'm furious every week. <laughs> every week. You know, I, I think Spencer, obviously, because he's the star of the show, gets, gets the most attention um, for the way that he... I guess, breaks a stereotype of what young Black men, um, especially in high school, are. But I think it applies like across the board. Like you've got Simone with these Beverly Hills parents as the face of teenage pregnancy. Yeah. Or you've got these, these Black kids at Beverly Hills and everyone would assume that they're airheads, but they're also very thoughtful and deep and care deeply about Black issues. Like they are very much Black in Beverly Hills. Absolutely. And that's what I wanted. I wanted people to understand, you know, and even within us, right, even in our community, you know, I grew up um, sort of all over the world. I was born in New York, but I was raised in Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, England, and then came back to the States for college. And depending on where I was in any given year, I was on three different continents. And depending on where I was, there was judgment about my accent or, you know what I mean, and what that meant for my Blackness. And I had a very British accent. When my husband first met me freshman year of college, I was so British, it wasn't even funny. And the assumption was, that's a weird configuration. They're like, wait, you have a British accent and you went to boarding school, but you're Black and you're from New York. And how does that... But I'm like, but that's... We exist too. 
you know, we're part of the spectrum too. And so I love being able to put Black characters on the screen that break the stereotypes that even we would normally put on them of what kids from Beverly Hills must be like or what kids from South LA must be like. Um, I like, because I didn't fit into any one box, I like having characters that don't fit into any one box. And that's, it's the same for even, you know, characters that quote unquote people um, term as our villains. I'm like, no, they're no villains. They're complicated people who make dumb decisions sometimes but they're no villains like anytime anyone seems to be going down a villain track you'll see us pivot because it's you know in a villain story to that villain they're the hero there's a reason for why they're doing what they're doing and they believe in it um it just has a very different impact on you know the person they're doing it to or the world and so i just i'm big on trying to circumvent those story those stereotypes because you know i i was an enigma to people growing up and i'm trying to sort of put the image out there that we all are you just got to dig deeper yeah yeah i, I mean I'm, I'm a black girl from the suburbs who went to prep schools all my life yeah you'd be like wait what <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like no we exist nuanced black people are a hard sell for other black people sometimes I know that you came on to, or I think that you came on to this show like for the pilot episode. So it was already a sell. Um, but in, in creating these storylines um, for these nuanced Black characters, is it a hard sell at the CW or are they just like, oh, okay, we get it? Um, you know what? Actually, it isn't. And uh, I don't know why my voice went up so high. Like I was surprised. But I think, you know, I came in um, right after they shot the pilot and um you know, the cast is so unbelievably phenomenal. And I suddenly was like, wait, we have so much potential here for the story we can tell that isn't a Beverly Hills savior story. Um, And the producers, you know, Greg Berlanti, the CW, Warner Brothers, they were all on board. And so, you know, my first episode of the show, which um, ended up being season one, episode three, where the boys get pulled over by the cops, Um, We ended up shooting that as the first episode after the pilot because both the CW and um, Warner Brothers were like, this is what the show is. Like telling nuanced stories where it's not just about a cop stop, but it's about the conversations that happen when they go home. And it's about digging deeper into why someone like Billy would have thought that just by raising his son in Beverly Hills, he was raising him in a bubble where he'd be exempt from being a Black man in America, which is absolutely untrue. And being able to have these conversations and have that conversation between Billy and Spencer, um, where Spencer's like, how could you not tell him? It's something I've known since, you know, basically I was leaving the house. My mom made sure I was prepared for that. And having Billy realize that he did so much to think he was, quote unquote, saving his kids from this experience. And the truth is you can't. The fact that I wanted to have that conversation to that level and not just, you know, gratuitously, you know, slam two young Black boys into the concrete with cops and then have them go off and play football the CW and Warner Brothers were so supportive of that and so on board and so like, go for it. And that's when I realized, I was like, oh, they really mean like we we get to tell our stories. And so um, it's been great. It's been great. And there have been times where, you know, we've come up with storylines in the writer's room and, you know, we're like, okay, this is going to end up being a two hour notes call because they're going to be like, you can't do or say that on TV. Um, and it won't be. And they'll, <laughs> they'll be like, that's great. Have them discuss which is a bigger threat to the community, gang violence or the cops. Yeah, go ahead, have that conversation. You know, go for it. And we're always just like, huh, okay, thank you. And we'll move forward. So they've been they've been great. And I think, you know, listen, I'm not a shy person and I'm a very convicted person. And when I feel very strongly about something, I make it very, very clear. And they've been extremely supportive of that. I think their attitude has been like, this is your life. This is your kid's life. You have a clear point of view on a story you want to tell. So we're going to get out of your way and let you tell it. Um, And that's been really great. I also think that it's very helpful that you got a hit show on your hands. Yeah. So clearly it's like, you know, well, whatever direction they're going, let them go because we got a hit. Absolutely. But all of season one, no one knew us. I mean, our ratings were declining on the CW. We hadn't premiered on Netflix yet. And even then I was like, okay, we may only get one season out of the show. So let's just swing for the fence and do what we want to do because there's a really good chance we're going to be canceled. Um, And then it hit on Netflix after season one and it was kind of the growth we saw was crazy. The CW picked us up immediately. And then even then, like we saw a little bit of growth 
um, linearly on the CW in season two, but it wasn't until season two hit Netflix that it kind of really exploded. And so for us, it was like, okay, I appreciated that even though our ratings weren't great that first season on the CW before the rest of the world discovered us on Netflix, that the CW states, they stood behind me um, and they supported the show. And and I would have been very salty if they'd canceled us. But I understand it's a business. You know, it's a corporate business. You're selling advertising. You need ratings and viewers to sell your advertising. I get all of that. But it's such an important show, I believe. And they understood that. So you know, that's been really great. And then to see actually this season, the ratings actually, people aren't waiting for it to come out on Netflix, which has been unbelievable. They are coming to the CW to watch it. And that's been, that's been crazy. We're in our third season and we're currently the CW's number one ranked show, which is insane. Um, And I made them double check that twice when they told me, I was like, are you sure? (laughs) Like, (laughs) wait a minute, wait a minute. I was just trying to stay on the air. Now we're number one. (laughs) I was like, listen, I believe in us, but are, you know, are are you? And they were like, no, like in 18 to 49, you're tied with Superman and Lois. And in 18 to 34, you blow everyone out of the water. Like we're the number one show right now. And that is a testament to um, our fans who have stuck with us no matter what platform and showed up. And, you know, we're so appreciative. Of it. And for me, it makes me super happy because the cast and the crew are so unbelievable, like super talented at what everyone does both on the cast side, on the production side, you know, it's just, it's talent upon talent upon talent. And it makes me so incredibly proud. And so to see all of that hard work get recognized um, this way has been, has been amazing. I'm, I'm really happy for everyone. I'm happy for everyone. As much as y'all stress me out, I keep saying that because like, I'm pretty stressed. <laughs> Um, but I'm one of the people that found the show on Netflix. Like I was getting my hair braided and I get like blonde braids down to my butt. So it's like yep. an 11 hour process. So I was like, well, what is this all American? Like, what is this about? And then like, I'm watching and then my braiders watching and they were like, oh no, oh no. Like, you know, it used to be a time when I would watch those shows like 90210 came out when I was in high school and I would watch the shows and like, I would relate to the, the teenagers. And now yeah. I watch the show and I feel like a parent and I'm stressed. Yep. Yep, that's right. Can we talk a little bit about your journey? Because I didn't know much about Hollywood or or Black folks' position in Hollywood. I assumed it was, you know, problematic the same way it is across nearly all industries. And I've read that there's like 90% of showrunners in Hollywood are white. Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. You are a Black showrunner. Yes. How do you put that <laughs> off, sis? Because <laughs> that's a feat. That's a feat in this business. Listen, I'm still trying to figure it out. I was like, how did I sneak in here? Um, no, you know, it's this industry. It is. It's like any other industry. And it is, you know, predominantly um, white. I think the industry is trying to take steps in the right direction, whether or not it is of the moment or it really is um, change happening. We'll see. Um, I'm a naturally optimistic person. You know, I believe in unicorns and rainbows and everyone starts with an A. And so I... I my heart believes that it is a movement in the right direction and that it's not just going to be for a moment. Um, and that is sincerely my hope. But for me, I, um, I sort of had a non-traditional uh, journey into the business because uh, I didn't go to school for this. I, I knew from the age of 13 that I wanted to be a writer. I was in boarding school in England at the time, had been introduced to Shakespeare, had been exposed to the Oxford Youth Theater. And I was suddenly like, oh my gosh, like I was obsessed with Shakespeare. I think I tell people everything they need to know about me covers the spectrum of my love of Shakespeare and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and everything in between. And, um, and I was just so blown away that any that words on a page could, even words that weren't in a um, sort of in a traditional English language that you that you would understand at 13 years old, you know, sort of, you know, it was in Elizabethan English and Shakespearean and, but I still felt and loved and it was so moving. And I was like, I want to be able to do that with my words. I remember having a conversation with my mom. I come from a very traditional Nigerian mm-hmm. family. Like, and so- <laughs> no, you know, my options were doctor, baker, lawyer, maybe engineer. And so in my head, I became very resolute. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to school for economics. Um, I was like, I'm not doing lawyer or um, I'm not doing law or uh, medicine. Um, I'm like, do not put me in charge of curing people's lives. 
Um, but I, I was good at economics and I genuinely enjoyed it. And so in my head, I didn't give up the dream. I was just like, we're just going to have to figure out another way to get there. And so I went to school for economics. Um, my undergrad degree is in um, economics with a uh, minor in French. My graduate degree is in international economics, which I got while I was working at the Federal Reserve. I would, for almost my entire 20s, would go to work at the Federal Reserve, do my, you know, trading in the morning, write my economic analysis in the afternoon that was going off to, you know, it was Chairman Greenspan at the time in D.C. And then I would leave work at 530 and take the subway to whatever black box theater we were putting up our play um, and, and go to rehearsals and do all of that stuff. And then we'd put up our plays. And I just lived this double life for most of my 20s. And the whole time I'd only written for theater and, but I was obsessed with television. My vision board, you know, had, um, you know, Sh- Shonda on it. It had Greg Berlanti on it, which is why it trips me out to today that Greg and I are friends. Cause I'm like, dude, at 21, you were on my vision board. Um, and, um, and I very quickly realized that, oh, the Nigerian in me, um, couldn't do the starving artist thing. I turn into a whole different human being when I'm broke. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not beautiful. I wouldn't want to subject anyone to it. I was like, I need to know where my car note's coming from. Got it. So the deal I made with myself was we're going to keep working. We're going to keep working at the Fed. We're going to do our day job. But at night, we pull out all the stops to get this career off the ground. So I would um, download scripts from the internet and I would watch the episodes and taught myself how to write for TV. Mm-hmm. It's how I learned what an act break was. It was I was like, oh, okay, we're building towards like a cliffhanger moment that makes them come back from the commercial break. Got it. Um, and I just for years while I was doing theater in New York and working at the Fed during the day, I was crafting my TV writing skill, putting myself through sort of my own masterclass. Um, and then finally, when I felt like my material was at a stage where if I put it out into the world, it wouldn't embarrass me. Um, I walked into my house and God bless my husband. We've been married all of six months. And I was like, I think I need to be in LA. I was like, I don't know how I I can break into the industry, but I feel like I need to, if I'm going to do TV, I feel like I need to be there to do it. And God bless him. He's a teacher. And he's like, listen, I can teach anywhere. He was like, you said this was your dream forever. You want to go to LA? We go to LA. Come on, husband. (laughs) January 1st, the next year, we packed up our entire lives and moved from New York to Los Angeles. Every weekend, it was short films, it was, you know, web series, anything I could do to create a name for myself in the field. I was doing, I would use my vacation days from work to do background work on General Hospital because I'd spent all my time on theater sets and I hadn't been on TV sets. So I'm like, I don't know, like, what, what's an assistant camera operator? What's a focus puller? I was like, I, I didn't know those terms or what those people did. So I was like, well, if I do background work, I could learn the positions. And so that's what I did. Like, I would literally leave major economic analysis meetings. And then the next day I'd be doing background on a soap. Um, and just talking to the crew and being like, Hey, what are you doing this weekend? I know you're an assistant camera operator, but do you want your first DP credit? We're shooting a short film in Simi Valley. And I basically created this, this village of artists. I would go sit in acting classes and then grab the actors after class. Like, Hey, you want to come shoot a short film on the weekend? And I built this little community of indie filmmakers. Um, and we, we, would shoot films on the weekends and you know my husband and I would be craft services we'd be cooking the rice and the chicken and everything the night before and he'd be serving it on set the next day um and um a couple of my films did really well on the film festival circuit and that landed me my literary manager um who I'm still with to till today Adesma McCullough and she just um dope black woman had just opened her own management company And I think I was maybe her first or second client she signed. But what I loved about her was I recognized the hustle. It was like hustle recognizes hustle. My husband and I still call her Rick Ross. Um, And I was like, somehow the two of us are going to figure this out together and we're going to grow your company and I'm going to land in a writer's room. And she had a really great sort of three-year plan. And literally it was maybe 10 months later to the date. We didn't even make it through the first year. And she'd cornered um like the roommate of the assistant of the executive producer to bones outside a bathroom at Nordstrom's I think and would not let the poor boy go pee until he agreed to give her his roommate's email address who was the assistant to Hart Hansen at the time so she could send my script in eventually 
the assistant read my script and really liked it and he passed it on to Hart and I was called in for my first and only showrunner meeting and I ended up getting the gig, which I found out the day my husband graduated from his PhD program at UCLA. So it was a huge celebratory day in our house. Um, And that I literally quit my job at the Federal Reserve on a Friday and I started on the Fox lot the following Monday um, in the writer's room of the Finder as a staff writer. Um, Thankfully have been blessed to work ever since and that will be 11 years this June. Feeling your best starts with what you eat. Sakara gives you the ability to not just eat healthy, but truly enjoy it with chef-crafted plant-rich meals that build a foundation for radiant health. Sakara is a nutrition company that focuses on overall wellness, starting with what you eat. Their organic, ready-to-eat meals are made with powerful plant-based ingredients and are designed to boost your energy, improve your digestion, and get your skin glowing. I just put in my Sakara order for the upcoming week. I got this amazing sweet potato-based Thai burger, the Szechuan noodles with roasted carrots, and also the Saqqara burrito bowl. I cannot wait for my next order to arrive. Along with delicious plant-rich meals, Saqqara also offers daily wellness essentials like supplements and herbal teas to support your nutrition. Experience the transformative power of plants with their best-selling metabolism super powder. Made with organic raw cocoa, it works to boost energy, eliminate bloating, minimize sugar cravings, and reduce fatigue. And right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash ratchet or enter code ratchet at checkout. That's Sakara. S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash ratchet to get 20% off your first order. Sakara dot com slash ratchet. I think it's important to continue learning to grow as a professional. Skillshare makes that happen. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers me to accomplish real growth. I was on the website recently looking for course options. There's a great class, Productivity for Creatives. Build a system that brings out your best. And this is taught by Thomas Frank. This is a great class for people like me who have a lot going on, but love to procrastinate. Thomas Frank teaches you how to order your steps so you can get more done. Do something today that you couldn't do yesterday with classes designed for real life. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Ratchet and get a free trial of premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash Ratchet. Thank you, Skillshare, for sponsoring this episode. I recently found a new bra that I don't want to snatch off as soon as I come in the house. And I figured out why. Third Love is designed to be a perfect fit. They use the measurements of millions of women to design bras with all day comfort and support. Every Third Love bra is made with signature memory foam cups, no slip straps, and a scratch free band. They've got cups from double A to I, including half cups and bands from 30 to 48 inches. To make sure that you get the perfect fit, they have the fitting room quiz. It's like a personal shopper for your boobs. The fitting room quiz focuses on size, breast shape, current fit issues, and your personal style to deliver bras and underwear that are perfect for you. The fitting room has already helped 18 million women find their true bra size. You could be next. Third Love is changing the game when it comes to comfort and style for all of your everyday essentials, from loungewear and wireless styles to their number one rated 24-7 classic t-shirt bra. They're creating the ultimate shopping experience. It's time to break up with your bad bra and fall in love with better bras and underwear. Your boobs deserve it. Third Love knows your one true fit is out there. So right now, they are offering my listeners 20% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash ratchet now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. 
That's thirdlove.com slash ratchet for 20% off today. So you're a showrunner of one hit show. You're the showrunner of the spinoff to this hit show, which is also going to be a hit. I'm speaking it into existence already. Amen, girl. I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. But what can you tell us about All American Homecoming, which is a spinoff of Simone's story? She's going to go to an HBCU. The spinoff came out of a conversation that I was having with um, Greg Berlanti and Robbie Rogers, who is Greg's husband and also a producer on the show. And he's a um, former amazing, unbelievable professional soccer player. Um, and so he's a lot of my resource for sort of that like athlete mentality between Robbie and Spencer Pacinger, like, because I don't have an athletic bone in my body. But um, we were all having a conversation of just like expanding the world and who we would expand the world with and what that would look like. And I was like, guys, we need to put HBCUs back on television. We need to put Black excellence back on television. People need to understand. And this was before, you know, of course, like this was before, obviously, the election and um, Kamala uh, uh, Harris and Stacey Abrams and everything. It was just, you know, and so, but what was great is the timing of it was I was having these conversations and then slowly but surely people were starting to talk more about HBCUs because of Vice President Harris, because of Stacey Abrams, because of Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. And I'm like, see, see, remember when I told you about the Black excellence thing? Those three women all went to HBCUs. We need to put that back on the television so that people understand what we're talking about when we say, like, you know, going to these schools is really about a whole different cultural, academic, Black excellence experience. It's not just, you know, um, this fictitious thing that was on a different world or, you know, and it's been a long time. It hasn't been on network TV since a different world. And then there was also the quad on BET. Um, but if you didn't have BET, you weren't, you didn't see the quad. So I was like, it's time for that to be back on TV. And um, then the question became, which character do we want to send to an HBCU? And Jeffrey Maya played by Simone is just a, um, supremely talented human being. Um, and I didn't want to take any of our lead girls off the show because I felt like there was still, I still had so much story I want to tell with Layla and Olivia um, and Coop in the grouping of the core cast we have. Like there's still so much to do with them and Spencer and Jordan. And I didn't want to break up our core. Um, so I'm like, okay, if I'm not removing one of them and sending them to an HBCU, so who are we going to do it with? And Jeffrey was one of those people who her character, when we originated it in season two, was supposed to be for three episodes, maybe. She was literally just supposed to serve this mini arc of, you know, a cautionary tale of Jordan's wild ways when he was acting out. And then now she's pregnant and then he finds out the baby isn't his and then she was supposed to go away. But she was so good. And her chemistry with Michael Bailing who plays Jordan, was so off the charts. And she's just such an amazing human being and from day one fit into the All-American family. And I was like, oh, I can't let her go. I'm like, she's fantastic. And so we kept her around on the show as Jordan's girlfriend and sort of started expanding her storyline more. And, you know, we met her parents and sort of the idea of where she comes from and this this almost unreasonable standard of excellence that her mom holds her to that is just, you know, suffocating to a certain degree. And it just, it was just that thing where it was like, it has to be Simone. She's who, she needs to break out of this mold that her mom has put her in. And she is figuring out what her life looks like outside of what her mom has crafted for her, who basically wants to make her into a mini her and wants her to go to Stanford and all of this stuff. And we had a chance to tell a story about a girl who goes to visit her aunt at an HBCU and finds home in a way that she hasn't yet. Um, and finally found a place where she felt like she could thrive and where the expectations that were put on her in this place were of excellence in whatever form suits you. Um, and that was basically the story. And so we started building the spinoff around that. And, and the idea that her mom has a sister who's almost a little bit of the pole opposite of the mom. She's a journalist and an activist, and she teaches at this HBCU, and she's really concerned for what she's seeing happening with Simone and sort of spiraling in terms of not being able to find herself outside of what happened with the pregnancy and everything and sort of push and pull with her mom. And so she invites Simone and some of her friends from 
LA to come visit for a weekend and they land on homecoming weekend and it just blows all of their minds. Um, And for Simone, especially she finds a place where she suddenly feels full and excited and hopeful about her future. And it's hard for her to walk away from that. I cannot wait because I didn't go to an HBCU and I don't have many regrets in life, but that's one of them. I should have gone to Howard (laughs) or Spelman. Yep. Yep. No, I, I, I'm the same. I'm surrounded by amazing people who all went to HBCUs. And I'm like, how did I, how did I miss this? Like I was coming from boarding school in England. And so that's how I missed it. But I'm just like, man, like I hear their stories and I hear them talk about their relationship with their professors and just, you know, the kind of discussions they were having in their curriculum. And I'm just, I, I missed, I missed an opportunity and I wish I'd gone. And so this show is my way of, of fixing that. Um, and we all get to go back to an HBCU now. I love that, that you're like, I missed it, but I'm going to create it. And so I get to experience it one way or another. Girl, listen, I'm still obsessed with prom because, you know, they don't do traditional proms in England. So I never had a prom. And I'm obsessed with prom because I've been obsessed with YA stuff for forever. And so I'm like, I'm going to, prom is going to be the biggest, baddest event on this show ever because I need to go to a prom. And so I'm reliving, I'm, I'm reliving. My son is just like, please just show, don't show up at my prom. I'm like, I'm trying to get it all out of my system before his prom so I don't have to, you know, upstage him there. But, um, but that's the beauty of writing and storytelling is we get to live out all these fantasies and everything. And so, yeah, it's, you know, creating the show around an HBCU is fulfilling a dream for me, you know, g- getting to write all American and tell the stories we're telling around Spencer and his friends is a dream for me. Um, hearing my son and his friends talk about subject matters that my husband and I have sat down and wondered, how are we going to introduce this to them without feeling like we're taking away part of their childhood? Or how are we going to, how do we start this conversation? And the show ends up starting the conversation for us. And that has been such a rewarding thing for me as not only as the showrunner of the show, but as the parent of a teen to realize like, oh, this really is helping us facilitate conversations we want to have. But because it's something that Spencer went through or because it's something that Layla went through, it's so much easier for us to have that conversation and now relate and talk about it in a broader sense with what's happening with him in school or friends or anything. And that's been one of the most rewarding aspects of this. Second half of this season debuts on April 12th. Yes. What what can we expect in the second half of the season? Uh, A lot. A lot. Like what I'm, I'm kind of asking is how much Xanax will I need? How many bottles of wine should I expect per episode? Kleenex in business. Okay. I will say that, you know, we're very, very proud of this season, not just because we feel like we've achieved miracles in a pandemic. Like, it's so funny. Every time someone's like, where's more football and where's this and where's that? And why are you taking a break? And I'm like, y'all, you realize we're shooting in the middle of a pandemic, right? Right. Like we're trying, like, I mean, my number one priority is to keep my cast and crew safe. And so, yes, that means a little less football this season because it doesn't get more full contact than football. Um, And in order to create that, we have to do quarantines. I got 50 football players quarantined for two weeks in hotels downtown. I got like, there's, there's a crazy process that goes into keeping these guys safe during a pandemic so that we could shoot football so we could shoot stuff like that. So, you know, we've been so incredibly proud of what we've been able to achieve this season, just given, you know, what was happening in the world. But the back half of the season and the storylines we get into, um, are important, are entertaining, and um, it's it's going to be a little bit of a wild ride. I mean, you know, episode eight ended with the car crash and the reveal that Olivia's been drinking, and that is mm-hmm. the first time that's Spencer's realization. And there's going to be crazy fallout from there. But if people are really paying our ten- attention, our show, and it's very important to me that this is at the heart of our show, our show, show isn't about glamorizing um, the crazy trauma. And, you know, it's not about just putting them through these crazy situations. It's about sending a message to our youth that no matter what you go through, there is light on the other side. As long as you have love and family and friends, and there's always a way through the storm to the rainbow and the sunshine on the other side. Um, And if people are paying close attention to our seasons and everything, that is what, no matter what happens, 
that's what comes out at the end of it. So what I can promise you is, despite the craziness that Olivia and Spencer and Layla and Coop and all of them are going through, um, you know, Jordan has a really big storyline coming through in the back half of the season. Despite all the drama, there is light at the end of tunnel for these guys because they love each other and they have amazing friendships and families and they have this village that no matter what happens, they're going to get each other through. And that's what you're going to see in the back half of the season. I cannot wait. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Are you bringing back Black Women Who Brunch? You started that alongside Lena Waithe. You bring together women behind, Black women behind the scenes in the industry. Is that coming back? Because I want to invite. <laughs> we never went away. We're still doing it. It's specifically uh, Black Women Who Brunch is uh, specifically for um, Black female TV writers. So the only requirement is that you have been staffed on a TV show in some capacity at some point. I'm an EP. I need to write. Okay. All right. I'm going to get an invite. I know, I know, but get, get, get that one episode in and we got you. Um, and, you know, it started as there were, uh, you know, Lena Waith, Erica um, Johnson and I uh, all sort of came up together as baby writers and we were sitting around one day and we were talking about the fact that like, there, there, there have to be more than just us. And um, a lot of the same names kept getting thrown around and we were like, while we appreciated the work, we're like, we know we're not the only ones. But it was very frustrating for us because like, you know, if someone called me and was like, I need a mid-level writer for a great genre show for HBO, I couldn't think of those names off the top of my head. Um, and that really bothered me. And so I was like, we have to find them. We all have to get to know each other. And the three of us were so, um, we were so determined. And so we're like, okay, we're going to start holding this brunch and get to know them. And everyone just invite who you know, who you've been on shows with before or whatever. And again, only requirement is that you're a Black female and you've been staffed on a TV show in any capacity. And so we started with, I think it was 12 people in the first one in my living room. Um, and we're now 172 oh, wow. deep. Um, and it's everything from staff writers to showrunners um, and everything in between. And then prior to the pandemic, so it would be quarterly meetings where um, they're closed door meetings. Our cone of silence is real because um, I will fight people in the street if I find out that anything that's gets said in that meeting. Because we have that's the whole point is we're here to support each other and give each other advice and lift them up. And if that's not under a cone of silence and if that the sanctity of that isn't protected, yeah. then you can't be part of the group. Um, and, you know, and it's because it's it's as much about sisterhood and bonding and surviving this industry as it is about referrals and helping each other get jobs. And we do all of that. Like we read each other's material. We could recommend each other based on, no, I actually like read the script. I know what this writer can do. Um, it's been such an amazing, amazing support system. And so um, it's quarterly meetings. And then we do one annual retreat, which we didn't do last year because of the pandemic. And we're trying to figure out how to get that aspect back. Um, but it's a, it's a group I'm really proud of. I have a huge portrait in my office from our Hollywood reporter shoot that has mm -hmm. all the women in it. And whenever life gets hard or whenever something feels a little crazy and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. I look up at that portrait and literally they are what keeps me going. I'm like, yeah, I can. Cause we're badasses. And I can pick up the phone and call Yvette Lee Bowser or I can pick up the phone and call Erica or, or Lena or, you know, any number of these writers that have formed such close relationships. You know, my my mentees who, frankly, I am i can't even claim them as mentees anymore because they're so excelling. And I'm just like, y'all just remember me when I need to keep up my, you know, WGA dues for <laughs> health insurance and my pension. Just give me a job because y'all are like blowing up. People like Ko Yegun and... Amy Aniobi and, um, you know, Amanda Idoko, they are just, I'm so amazingly proud of these women and honored to know them. And, you know, this group, this writers group is what brought us all closer. And so we all get through this industry together. Look, Ninkechi, I moved out here to be a writer. I got the film and the executive producer thing, but I moved out here to be a writer. I'm going to get my writing credit and I'm going to come to y'all. Do market. it. <laughs> <laughs> we would love that. We would love that. And yeah, and let's, you know, let's talk. Let's talk about the writing dream and what you want to do and, and let's make it happen. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me on here. My pleasure. Like, I love you. I love, I liked you before I talked to you. Now I love you and I love your show and I can't wait for the spinoff. I'm Gugab's excited. 
<laughs> Thank you. Well, the feeling is very mutual. You are out there changing the game and hustling your way, and it has not gone unnoticed. I'm, I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of you. Thank you so much. Now, please go enjoy your good Friday and, and your new niece or nephew. I appreciate yes, you ma'am. taking the time this morning. <laughs> Anytime. She's amazing. Still trying to get on that invite list. You see, I tried to throw out. I was like, I'm an EP. I got, I got an EP credit. And she was like, mm writers only. I'm going to get an invite to one of them branches. I ain't playing with these people. Mark my words. It's going to happen. Anyway, that is today's podcast. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. I told you about the merch and the 20% off at the beginning of the episode, so I don't need to repeat myself now. But if you want some, please go to DemetriaLLucas.com and pick it up while it's still available. Once these Don't Waste Your Pretty Hitties are gone, They're not coming back until the fall for the obvious reason that the whole country is going to be hot. Ain't nobody walking around a hoodie in 80 degree weather. Or you shouldn't be. I ain't trying to be responsible for nobody's heat stroke. Thanks. If you need some ratchet and respectable in your life between now and next week for Tuesday's episode, you know, I always got a little something for you. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Demetria L. Lucas. Otherwise... Oh, just FYI, you know we're going to have to do a break in the episodes at some point. I've been going four months straight, twice a week. So please prepare yourselves in advance. It might be a week, it might be two. I'm just giving you warnings in advance. Okay, bye.